So I'm Doug Norton with uh, TMT, and this is Steve Turner. Uh, our CTO would have liked to have been here, but he's actually got a wife who's uh, expecting uh, and probably doesn't want to get that far from Austin at this point. So we're going to kind of tag team this uh, to make up for um, the lack of uh, Brad being able to be here for us all. So I'm Doug Norton. I'm uh, the, the CMO of uh, TMT, which really means I'm responsible for all our technology partnerships as well as the customer side of it. So I want to talk a little bit about, at the beginning, just uh, kind of where this has come from and some of the customer experiences. Then we'll uh, dive into what it is with Steve. Um, interesting, our, the name of our product is Sequence L. It was a language for sequences, but not sequencing, which is so significant. And what a great talk. Really enjoyed that. Um, sequences as in arrays or, you know, lists and lists of lists and all that good stuff. So we're going to talk to you about a better way to convert algorithms into massively uh, parallel robust code. Um, okay. Um, I come from an EDA background. I spent many years in electronic design automation, and it struck me when I was at a conference last year with the CTO of Autodesk who put this uh, slide up, uh, and he let me borrow it. And he said, basically, we're way behind our EDA people. Uh, counterparts, uh, we're still just essentially documenting what people come up with in their heads in the mechanical CAD world. And he showed numerous examples, including this chair, uh, which he said would have never been done, you know, dreamed up by a human. It was strictly driven by the math to drive the lightest, strongest chair you could. So essentially mechanical synthesis to come up with this and then, you know, 3D printed to make it. And he had several other great examples. But, um, so if you look at, okay, what we're doing in our world of software development, right, we've got these eight simple steps, and it's a very manual process to do things. And I would argue that step zero is hiring a team of parallel ninjas, as uh, Intel likes to call them, uh, who are, you know, experts in computer architecture and can dive into code and do all this good work. And then by the time they've done it, like our previous guy pointed out, the algorithms have changed, and it's almost not worth it. So... The Einstein quote here to me is very relevant, right? Um, the significant problems we face can't be solved using the same level of thinking when we created them. Um, because even the, when I get the people in the room, like some of you guys are probably that 1% of the people in the world that might be these guys, these programmers. Uh, do you do this on all your projects? Right, um, it, you know, how do you find them, afford them, retain them? Uh, we hear all the time. Um, you know, everybody's saying you need to modernize your code for the new architectures of different processors and accelerators. Well, you know, people are going, wow, how do I even try to support now a Power 8 architecture or maybe some new ARM multi-core architecture because I've written all this low-level code that's tied to SIMD instructions and all that. Um, and then, oh gosh, how do you ensure the accuracy of that, right, as you break it up and scale it and all that. So, What's interesting is we've been kind of doing things the same way for a long time now. Um, if you go back to the history of programming, we've always abstracted things away. Uh, ones and zeros were a big deal when they came out, when you didn't have to rewire a computer. Um, when assembly language uh, first hit, right, people were saying it'll never be as good as my ones and zeros. Um, but we moved on. We did more things. Um, Fortran came out in around 56, 57. And there was heresy. People said, high-level languages, compilers, stupid idea. It'll never work. We've always moved forward, though, and done more things. And, you know, we've been band-aiding this uh, object-oriented C++ park play stuff for about 37 years now. Uh, Multi-core hit, you're 25 years into that. And we just keep trying to apply, you know, sequential tools to solve parallel problems. Um, so... What we've got is a, a, a very high performance, it's been nicknamed MATLAB on steroids, um, simple language that works with other languages that outputs massively parallel C++. So it builds upon that. It works with C++ or Fortran or Java or Python or all those good things, but it lets you do so much more. So benefits, clearly our customers see much faster performance because it's going to use all the cores and even GPUs. Uh, getting it right the first time, it's much simpler to, when you're worrying about what you're trying to solve instead of all the low-level details of how to do it to get it right. It's also much faster to write, as you'll see. It lets it be able to, your code be able to move then to um, different architectures and optimize, optimally do so. And it's built up, built upon open standards. Um, so Eclipse, C++, OpenCL, those kind of things. And we're also looking at CUDA.
So here's a quick example from one of our customers, Southwest Research. Uh, they had a CFD code, very large code. Um, the slide's actually out of date now. It's not just 17.8 times faster. They've run bigger problems, and now the sequence L is 26 times faster than uh, the Fortran and OpenMP code they were using. Um, just smoked it. So not only is it that much faster, so runs that were taking two weeks can be done overnight, um, and it self-parallelized with no input from the, the, the developer, but it was 25% less lines of code. So much simpler to read, to enhance, to take to the next level, to test, all those kinds of things. And this was their guys doing the work. It took them a few months to move this big code into sequence L. Um, another one here in the Dallas area is Lockheed Martin, uh, the missile fire control guys. Uh, they came up with an algorithm. Um, it's kind of their secret sauce. They use it in a lot of things they do to uh, take video input and that's coming in at 30 frames a second, and they want to process this to take away distortion, heat, you know, atmospheric dust, all those kinds of things. Turbulence, they call it turbulence mitigation. So in the best they could get before using this in MATLAB was 21 hertz, uh, and that was in the interpreter. When you actually ran it through coder to get C code out, you lost all the optimization. It ran at 1.2 frames a second. On the same machine, we were able to ultimately hit 58 frames a second, easily keeping up with the real-time input. So one of the beauties of Sequence L is you can control how many cores you run on at runtime. So by default, it'll use them all, but you can say, hey, just give me one core, and you get that. And then say two cores, and three cores, and then four cores, ultimately, they hit the goal of the keeping up with the video input. So that's the type of thing sequence all can do. It was also much more readable again than the code that they started with. So I'll hand it over to Steve to dive into more on how we do all this. Okay, thanks, Doug. So the question is, what is sequence L? Sequence L is a high abstraction, functional, self-parallelizing computer language. Um, I kind of like to describe it as a language that is inherently multi-core. So built into the language is the ability to use all the cores, and there is no programmer requirement to specify how to do it or where to do it. It's all handled by the computer. So we have the, uh, the compiler, the debugger, the interpreter, and uh, these items are designed to work in concert with uh, existing tool flows. Okay, so what do we mean by functional, high abstraction, high performance language? Most language out there are imperative languages. That's your Java's, your Python's, your C++. You have a set of instructions of what it is that you want to do, and not only what it is that you're trying to do with the software, also you're telling the computer exactly how to do it. Um, this is inherently sequential, and that's kind of natural considering the origins of these high-level languages. They came about during the days of single, uh, single core CPUs and computers, and this is what uh, these languages were designed for. Sequence L is uh, declarative. You can look this up on uh, Wikipedia at some point later on if, if you're not too familiar with it. A declarative, functional, higher abstraction language. It, it kind of sits above the Javas and the C++ the same way that they sit up above the assembly language. So the best analogy would be an SQL database language. Just as a show of hands, how many folks here are familiar with um, SQL as a, a language? Okay, most of you. Um, so basically what you're doing with, you know, a query is you're identifying what you want out of the database and then you're letting the database engine do all the how to do it and then it produces the result. And you simply trust the result that's coming out because that database engine written by Oracle or whoever it was has been optimized and vetted and you know that it works. So you could imagine the current design flow as, um, at least uh, for code generation, as working with um, an editor or uh, an integrated development environment to develop uh, software, high-level software, C or Java or what have you, um, and it ends up going into a compiler and a linker, and you bring in legacy application code that's already been built that you want to leverage, along with some libraries perhaps, and the result is object code. So sequence L is designed to work with this, not to break it. 
So alongside of it now, there would be some development in the sequence L computing language. The compiler would then would take that sequence L and turn it into parallelized C++ code or optionally open CL code. And then this fits in your existing tool flow. It would run through a compiler and produce uh, a resulting object code. And along with the, the source code that I was just describing, we would bring in our runtime libraries. And this is the part of the sequence L that is able to examine the hardware, find out how many cores there are, and it will take your algorithm and deploy it across however many cores that it finds. So here's an example, um, a three-body uh, a three-body gravitational example, <clears throat> excuse me. So you have this uh, grav function that defines gravity vectors for the other two bodies acting on this one body. And then you get um, a, a change in velocity based on the acceleration vector and the uh, delta time. And then um, you, uh, through that, you get a new velocity. You multiply that also by the delta time. You end up with a change in position. And that works also for the other two bodies in this three-body simulation. So you're thinking, well, I'd like to parallelize this. And naturally, what you would probably come up with is I'll compute each one of these different um, new positions for these bodies simultaneously. So I'll get, in theory, a three times speed up. Now, the way this is done typically is with directives put on top of, let's, let's pretend this is C code or maybe it's Java, but um, you would have these pragmas, these compiler directives. And what happens here is the developer is identifying what parts are able to be parallelized, puts these directives around them, and then this will allow each one of these three processes to be computed more or less simultaneously. But the burden here is on the programmer to identify the parts of the program that can be parallelized without stepping on each other. But maybe you could parallelize some other things. Each one of these um, bodies in the three body problem is acted on by two others. So what if we were to be able to compute both of these in parallel and achieve more than just a three times speed up? So you might rearrange the code, you now have all these different gravity vectors being computed simultaneously in a similar manner as we saw earlier with the, uh, with the pragmas directing the compiler what to parallelize, what is safe to parallelize. The difficulty here is that you could introduce possible race conditions. So by leaving the burden on the pro programmer, you end up with um, an error-prone process in which um, unforeseen errors could be injected into your code. And they give the example, this grab function. Maybe the grab function itself calls other libraries, so you'd have to go inspect what that function does because it may end up calling libraries that are not thread safe. So how would we do this in sequence L? Well, here's an example. You have a, a function call, three body, and it identifies each one of these variables in, a, in what's called a let body. The let body defines what the variables are going to be in terms of what they're, what, uh, well, in terms of the, the way it was done before. And then you have a final answer down here in, in the end part. So basically, you, you want this uh, function to produce this, uh, this new position for each of these three bodies. The compiler itself, the sequence L compiler, can go through and look at this and identify parallel parts on its own. It doesn't need human input to do it. It will also use uh, vector instructions uh, anywhere that it's possible. So what you end up with is, is optimally running software without the, uh, without the programmer having to specify all these things. So let's take a, take a look at an example of just building up an algorithm from scratch, let's say. So we have a matrix multiply. So you'll recall that um, this is like from your high school algebra, an M by P matrix called A multiplied by a P by N matrix called B. The result is an M by N matrix denoted AB, whose entries are given by, and then you, basically what you have is a summation of dot products for the rows and the columns. Now, if you're going to implement this in Java, and this is not just Java, but C++ or just about any imperative language, you would probably do it by a triply nested loop. The outer loop would be handling the rows, the inner loop would be, or the second, the middle loop would be handling the columns, and then the bottom loop, the innermost loop, would be handling 
the summation from the dot product. If you look at this source code, this line here, line 12, you have a result, uh, I sub j is equal to a summation of this product of the uh, members of the vector. This one line looks a lot like what you have here, but all these other lines of code, they're kind of framework, they're scaffolding to support this one line right here. This scaffolding and framework tends to be error prone. It's tedious at times. And error prone, tedious things are what computers do. That, that's what they excel at. That's what we rely on them for. So if we were to uh, look at this in sequence L, you'd see a much smaller set of source code here, source lines, in which um, this, this K is equal one to size B uh, corresponds to this subscript K. And then you have a sum of A sub IK times B sub KJ, and that actually matches pretty well what the function looks like. So in sequence L, your code looks a lot like the mathematical equations that are driving your algorithm. There's an operator in sequence L called the all operator, and it could simplify this from being several lines of source code just to one. And again, you can see how this maps back to the mathematical definition rather, rather clearly. This one line of sequence L is fully parallelized. It'll run on one core, it'll run on two cores, it'll run on 500 cores. And we have uh, some of the uh, early adopters testing with this and they decided to give it a, a matrix with five billion entries and it was able to compute all of them without any, without any errors and very rapidly across all available cores. That uh, previous slide that I had mentioned that we talked to, this is single threaded. So if you had a 32 core machine, you're running on one, one core. To parallelize this, you can add plenty of um, pragmas, as, as we had seen before, to direct the compiler as to what can be safely parallelized. But what you'll end up with is something approaching 100 lines of code. So what kind of performance increases do we see? And the C++ reference for this matrix multiply shown here, even with a single core, the sequence L is outperforming it. And I was asking some of the developers, how, how is it they were outperforming? And he was telling me that sequence L is very good at memory usage. So most of this increase is going to be either to memory and the vector instructions that sequence L will employ. And when you throw some more cores at, at the problem, you, you increase performance, so you're actually getting a a kind of a super linear performance increase compared to the reference. But in general, these are the type of performance increases that you could see. Uh, the black straight line right here is, is the ideal perfection for scaling of a performance as more CPUs are added. So pleasingly parallel or embarrassingly parallel algorithms such as uh, two-dimensional FFT are right up here pretty close to linear scaling with a number of CPUs. Interesting thing about this one down here, this is um, LU factorization. I don't know much about LU factorization, but I've been told by people who do that on four processors, getting a nearly three times performance increase is, is pretty good for uh, LU factorization. Um, let's see, okay. I'm going to skip this one because we're running a little bit late on time. And there we go. Thanks for your time. That's a quick look at it. Ready for any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Steve. Are there any questions? Oh, just walked around the room. Come back to the front here. Yeah, I just want to know um, if your programmers are programming this, would they ever know a new learn the language? Um, yeah, uh, you do. And it, the key, I think one of the things uh, here, we, we talked about this a little bit in the flow. Um, Sequence L, what we normally would do here is take just a piece of your program out and redo it. We can literally teach you this language in an hour because the whole idea was to not reinvent the wheel. Um, Sequence L doesn't, it, it only works where it adds value, which is the algorithmic part of the code. We don't do any IO or things like that. So 
normally what we do is that legacy code where you might go update it in C++ or Fortran. Instead, you could take that piece out and let's go just do it in sequence L. And literally this much code usually squishes down to this much and now it's very high performance. You get the parallel C++, you link it in. The rest of your application looks and feels the same, but now it just runs a lot faster. Uh, one CTO actually told us it was faster for them to rewrite a module in sequence L than it was to find and fix the bug in it. So it's just it's just that simple. And once people start doing it, they're like, well, let's go do some more. Where's the next bottleneck? And uh, and they just keep going. So every uh, every new Intel processor that comes out always has like more AVX instructions and some DE components. Uh, how soon after that happens do you all integrate that into your environment to take advantage of it? Yeah, we're uh, very strategically partnered with Intel, with IBM, with AMD, with ARM, with Microsoft. Um, we're very aware of what they're in, you know, Xeon 5s and GPUs, all that, right? So um, we tend to be pretty quick on it. We don't want to move too fast because then sometimes uh, code on a, a legacy processor won't work as well if it's not using those. So um, we tend to, you know, be six months or so after that, just give some time for them to get in the market and be out there. Yes, yeah. So that runtime, that runtime library at the bottom left corner there, that's the platform specific stuff where we do all that optimization work. Yeah. So we have a question from one of our developers, and I just learned that he speaks. So here you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how does your uh, language and environment differ from uh, existing functional languages like uh, Haskell, perhaps, and, uh, you know, data oriented languages like R? What do you offer? over and above, and how does it differ? Uh, very good question. Um, so we used to have on our website a Haskell comparison, but we were told we weren't good enough Haskell people, that wasn't quite as optimal as how they've done it. We just got away from that. The, the thing, I guess one of the people who got into this and looked at it said, you know, you guys almost should advertise an IEEE Computer Magazine that you guys are using some Haskell under the covers so we don't have to. Um, because Haskell is not an easy language to learn. We've been implementing actually more and more of our tools in Sequence L and getting rid of the Haskell, and they're speeding up. Um, as, and, and that's a testament. I mean, we have a, our Sequence L interpreter now is written all in Sequence L. So that's one of those, you know, checkmates in uh, computer languages, right? And it runs a whole lot faster than it did when it was C and Haskell. Um, R is obviously a statistics language. It's a subset. It's not a... Um, uh, what's the word? Um, it's not a complete language, just like SQL is not a complete language. We are um, um, Turing complete, right? So it is a full language. We just don't do I.O. Okay, and again, there's so many white papers. This was developed in a 25-year uh, plus period in partnership with NASA. ton of white papers on the website and some videos and things like that. But seriously, you'll come out of those and say, I just need to try this myself. So I'll save you the five or six hours. We'll teach you two in an hour. Um, we're coming out with a freemium model soon that's going to be available um, via Nimbix. We want to put it up in the cloud and let people try it. And um, we've got some self-paced tutorials now as well to come up to speed. So for now, we can turn on a trial. Soon we'll have a freemium version. Okay.